Hello, welcome to another IGCC History of Revision lecture. This is part five of the series that I am doing on the international relations component of the CIE history course. The topic I'm covering today is undoubtedly one of the longest and possibly the most content heavy of all the IGCC topics. Um, and as a result, the video is going to be a little longer than it would typically be as well. Uh, however, I have time stamped the video so you can go to the specific parts of it if you wish and kind of dip in and out um, as you see fit. Okay, um, and the topic for today is, as you can see from the title of the slide, um, is key question five, how effectively did the USA contain the spread of communism? Um, despite being the longest topic, I find this is probably the most interesting as well in terms of the topics it covers, okay? So the last topic was about um, the causes of the Cold War and how it developed, okay? And if you remember, towards um, the end of that period, the USA developed this doctrine of containment, okay? Um, so this topic basically looks at three key case studies um, of the USA attempting to contain communism around the world. And those three case studies are the Korean War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the war in Vietnam. So for this topic, you need to have a detailed understanding of each of those three case studies, um, including a background to the situation there, why the United States is involved in that country in the first place, um, and obviously just kind of a general summary of the different events um, taking place in that particular crisis. Um, now, there are a range of specific things you have to know about each top crisis, and they are different in many ways. However, the link between all three is containment. So while the four and six mark questions for these three case studies are typically about the individual case study, and I'll give some examples later on when I go through each one, the 10 mark question is usually, and more often than not, a comparative one about the success of containment. So you can either get a general 10 marker about how successful the USA was with its policy of containment without specifying any particular case study, or it could even ask you to specifically compare two case studies. So how far was the Korean War um, uh, a more successful version of, uh, example of containment compared to the Vietnam War, for example? Um, but that's the key link between them. So in some ways, this is essentially three separate mini topics, but they are all one topic together because there is this common link, which is containment and the relative success or not of the USA's containment policy in each of these three case studies. So I'm going to do two things, well, four things for this lecture, really. We start off by, first of all, going over a recap of what containment is and also linking it a little bit more to the specific examples we're going to use in this, we're going to see in this topic. And then I'm going to go over each of the three case studies um, and go, I'm going to go into them in some detail, however, not as much detail as it would be if you were studying them as their own separate topics. So for example, if you were doing a Vietnam War module in a different course, it'd be significantly longer than it is here, but you still need to know about it in some detail to actually understand what's going on, okay? So going back to the idea of containment, okay? Um, so as just on the last topic, by the end of the 1940s, the United States government had decided on a new foreign policy strategy, okay, um, in response to the spread, or as it saw, the spread of communism across, the, across Europe and across the world after the Second World War. Truman settles on and comes up with this idea of containment. Um, he doesn't quite use that exact language, um, but that's what it's been referred to since then. The basic idea here is that the United States will seek to stop the spread of communism wherever it seeks to expand across the globe, okay? And this can mean simply financially supporting um, governments, and it can also go as, and giving them kind of military assistance in terms of funding and giving them weapons, but it can also go up to and include sending US combat troops into countries to help stop communist movements if necessary, okay? So it can include anything, including and up to US combat troops involved in a conflict. However, and again, I mentioned in the last lecture, we have to understand that containment is different to something called rollback, okay? So rollback is the idea that where there is, that you basically roll back communism in countries in which it already exists, okay? So removing communist governments where they have already come into government or into power, essentially. Um, this is different to rollback, okay? Containment is simply stopping it from spreading into further countries or protecting countries that are on the verge of potentially going communist. But countries that have already turned communist, that's rollback, and this is not what containment is, okay? 
Um, so for example, Eastern Europe is considered a lost cause because it's already under USSR control. There's not much more you can do. There are examples of the US attempting rollback as we'll even see in this topic. Um, but generally speaking, this topic's focused on containment only. Now, to develop this idea of containment a little bit further, okay? Another idea which comes about a few years after containment develops, and it kind of works hand in hand with it, is a kind of development of the consequences of not containing countries, okay? So there's something called the domino theory, okay? And this becomes a really prominent foreign policy theory in America in the, 19, in the 1950s. And this theory basically states, and as you can see from the little diagram over here, um, if one country in a region is, was to fall to communism, the theory states that communism then spreads to countries around it. And so countries around that place in the same region will fall to communism like dominoes. And the fear from this really came from when China in 1949 became a communist country. Okay, so in 1949, China turns communist, and this is a really massive source of paranoia for the Americans and other powers. And there is a feeling that if we don't stop communism spreading elsewhere, this is going to create a domino effect, and the rest of the region and all of Asia is going to eventually turn communist. Um, and so Asia becomes the first really major containment battleground for the Europe for the United States, where they see multiple countries as being threatened with communist expansion and therefore feel the need to intervene. And two of the examples we're looking at in this topic, of course, are in Asia, which is Korea and Vietnam. Um, so just a brief background in terms of what containment was again, and then this idea of the domino theory. So there is this genuine paranoia amongst the Americans that communism or the, the communist plan to spread, ac spread across the globe, and they really wish to stop it as much as they can. So the first example of this, and the first real test of containment is the Korean War, okay, in 19, which starts in 1950. Um, so Korea is the first real Cold War conflict. Now the Berlin blockade, which happened only a couple of years prior to that, was the first Cold War confrontation, okay, where it looked like war potentially was going to break out. But the Cold War becomes a hot war in Korea. We have an actual war breaking out. And on this point, it's worth noting, this is, often, this is often referred to as the Forgotten War. And the reason being is, this conflict receives very little public attention. And it's because it's basically sandwiched between other bigger conflicts, okay? Um, you have the Second World War beforehand, which is obviously more important from the Western perspective. And then there's also the Vietnam War, which comes shortly afterwards. And as we're going to see later on, because of the social upheaval it causes in America, Vietnam is this very powerful symbol. So we have Korea sandwiched between these two more important conflicts. And so for that reason, it gets forgotten. Now, it's worth pointing that out because the Korean War is a really big war. Because it's not often talked about so much, you assume it's just not important. But this is a, a massive conflict in which um, around two to three million civilians are killed. There are over a million US, ca US casualties, and it involves hundreds of thousands of US soldiers fighting in this war. It is a significant conflict, okay? But because of what comes before and after, it's just less relevant in the public, in the public's historical memory. But it's still a very, very important event. And of course, it's an event that has consequences, long-term consequences that are still being felt today. So, what is the background to the conflict in Korea? Um, and the same that we're gonna see with the Vietnam War later on, Background to conflict in, conflict in Korea basically stems from the end of the Second World War, okay? Japan as a country had invaded and conquered most of its neighbors up to 1941-42, okay? Um, Korea had been conquered by Japan in the early 20th century and had been ruled by Japan up until the end of the Second World War. Korea had in fact been annexed officially by Japan and it was essentially a part of Japan as far as Japan was concerned. It wasn't a country they were occupying their perspective, it was like a permanent conquest. And so at the end of the Second World War, Japan has been defeated and the territories that it conquered before and during the Second World War have basically been surrendered. And Korea, not unlike what happens to Germany, as we saw the last topic, is temporarily divided into two. And in this case, two occupation zones. The north of Korea becomes a Soviet occupied occupation zone or a Soviet-controlled occupation zone, and the south of Korea is an American-occupied or controlled zone. And the border 
is this kind of arbitrary um, line called the 38th parallel. It's basically a line of longitude. Oh, latitude, I can't remember what it is. It's basically a, a longitude, longitudinal line, okay? Um, it just, they thought, it's a temporary border. Let's just stick it down the middle. Um, that makes as, as much sense as anything to them because it's meant to be temporary. And so, not dissimilar to what happened in Germany, the idea was that these two countries were supposed to be reunified. However, as the relationship between America and the Soviet Union sours, we find that um, unification and ability to cooperate over Korea seems less and less likely. And just like in Germany, Korea's initially temporary division becomes essentially a formal division when the two countries, the two zones, are declared as separate independent states, or rather separate independent states are declared in both the northern zone and the southern zone. Um, the north becoming the DPRK, North Korea, and the south becoming the Republic of Korea. And so if you look at these two countries, um, unsurprisingly, as is the case still today, the two governments that are set up despise each other, okay, due to their massive ideological differences. So South Korea, or the Republic of Korea, is set up under a leader called Syng Man Rhee. Um, now, it's worth noting, this was not a, dem a very democratic country. In fact, it wasn't democratic at all. But it was staunchly anti-communist. Syng Man Rhee was rabidly anti-communist. And for the Americans, this is more than enough, okay? So as a result, the Americans throw their support behind the new um, South Korean government and prop them up, essentially. In North Korea, we have the formation of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, okay? And this is set up under Kim Il-sung, the name Kim, Kim should ring a bell. This is the grandfather of the current leader of Korea, Kim Jong-un. Um, and so Kim Il-sung was a Soviet trained, in other words, he was trained in the USSR, um, leader, and he was supporting, or rather he was running a communist state, and it was, sorry, he was a communist leader, and he was running a one-party state. So the, the DPRK is a communist-run, one-party state backed by the Soviet Union, financially and militarily, as well as eventually China, who has also gone communist. Now, here is a key point, because as you're going to see, um, if you look at part of the questions, the question of why there is a war in Korea um, is a common six mark question. And the very simple reason is both leaders believed they had the right to rule all of Korea. Neither side recognized the legitimacy of the other government. And so they both want the peninsula of Korea to be reunified. So both of them intend to take over the other or take control of the other side of the country. However, given their hostility towards each other, there was no chance at all of the two countries peacefully unifying. So if there was to be a unification of Korea, it would have to come via one of the two sides conquering the other by force. And this is what happens in the summer of 1950. Of the two sides, it is this, the North Koreans who are more powerful because they are receiving more direct backing from both the Chinese and the Soviet Union. And so in the summer of 1950, Kim Il-sung decides to make his move and he decides to invade South Korea, okay? Now he does this, as I said, to unify Korea and eliminate what he considers to be the illegitimate government in the South. Now, in hindsight, this seems like a rash move because as we're gonna see later on, the Americans intervene. However, at the time, he had good reason to believe that his attempt would be successful. There are three main reasons for this. So number one, as I've already mentioned, he was backed militarily and financially, but in particular militarily, by both Stalin in Russia and Mao Zedong in China, okay? Both who are essentially bordering North Korea. Um, and in particular, he was being heavily armed by the Soviet. He was being given tanks, artillery, planes. And so militarily, he was definitely far stronger than the South. So if there's a question of those two fighting one-on-one, -on -one, then the North will definitely defeat the South. Secondly, the proximity of Korea to China. And by this point, the Soviet Union had now developed their own atomic bomb, okay? So the military situation between the Americans and the Soviet Union had now become much more equal compared to the earlier part of the Cold War, say 1945. Um, and so he felt it was unlikely that the United States would act in response to the situation because it might provoke China and the Soviet Union. And so he thought they're not gonna get involved. Additionally, 
Korea was very far away from the US. And again, from his perspective, he just didn't think that Korea would be a particularly significant defense priority for the US. So he knew that if he invaded Korea, he'd, he'd definitely defeat the South Koreans, or rather invade South Korea. And he thought there's no chance the Americans getting involved, or there's very, very little chance. That is, of course, the fateful mistake that Kim Il-sung makes. He was, in fact, wrong in his calculation. Contrary to his beliefs, the US were determined to get involved and stop the South being taken over. So you can also get questions, six markers, saying, why does the US intervene in Korea? And again, there's a couple of very simple reasons. The first, very simply linked to this topic, the US was now fully committed to the idea of containment, okay? This wasn't immediately clear at the time because it was a very new policy and it was so different to how the Americans operated beforehand. But um, look, as it, as it turned out, it, it wasn't just words and you know cheap talk. The US was committed to the idea of containment, okay? Um, additionally, communism was seen as always being directed by Moscow. So in the US's perspective, when communist movements are creeping up across the world, they view these as all being nefarious plots being pushed and directed from Moscow directly, okay? And so it was not seen by the US, as Kim thought, um, as a very far away conflict, which isn't really relevant to the, United, to the United States. It was very much seen as a crucial Cold War battleground. And for that reason, they were determined to get involved. Secondly, we could bring this up back to the idea of the domino theory. Um, the, the, the US saw this as a crucial um, example of the domino theory coming into effect. In their belief, if Korea was to fall totally to the communists and be reunified under Kim Il-sung, this would lead to the fall of other United States-backed nations in the region. In particular, there are two countries that are seen to be a US strategic and economic interest in the region. First of all is Taiwan, or it is effectively China. But at this point, when the Chinese government is overthrown in China, they flee and go to an island close to China called Formosa. This then becomes Taiwan, okay? This is a US-backed government and which the, with which the US has relations. But more importantly, they also feared the potential fall of Japan, which you might be thinking, hang on, wasn't Japan at all with America in the Second World War? When the war ends, Japan America helps to rebuild Japan, and Japan becomes a really important trading partner for the US in the Far East. So potentially, you know, they could see the fall of both Taiwan and Japan to communism if, the, if they do not intervene in Korea. So linked to the domino theory, they feel they have to be involved. However, it is worth mentioning, because you might then get a bit confused when you read things. This is, to be honest, a US intervention. And it is the US driving what happens and makes the decisions. However, when the US becomes involved in the Korean War, it is not officially on their own. Instead, the intervention in the Korean War is an official intervention or action by the newly formed United Nations, which has now replaced the League of Nations. Okay? Um, You'll often see it referred to in a textbook or an exam as either the UN or the UNO, the UNO being, being the United Nations organization. Um, it's worth mentioning, in contrast to the League of Nations, which never ever got involved militarily in any conflict, um, the UN does almost immediately, um, five years after its formation. So the US becomes involved, but they do it as an official United Nations intervention. So technically, it's not the US that gets involved in the Korean War. It's a United Nations army, but it is effectively led by and controlled by the United States. Um, so how does the UN become involved, the UN slash the US? Um, so Truman, to be honest, would have intervened in Korea no matter what happened, okay, with the UN. Had the UN failed, or had he failed to get the UN to pass resolutions to be involved in Korea, he would have got involved anyway, okay? But to make things look better, okay, in terms of like an international, you know, view of the event or the situation, um, he, he wants the UN to get involved officially instead of it being an American war, okay? And so Truman takes the matter immediately to the UN Security Council and begins applying pressure for them to pass a resolution calling for military action, which they do, okay? Um, and so even though it was clearly a US-led operation, because the UN votes in favor, 
Um, this means the anti-communist forces in Korea are officially a coalition of 15 countries. So quite a few other countries send soldiers. For example, Britain sends a few thousand soldiers to fight in Korea as well. Now, it's worth noting, normally this would not have been possible. As those of you who know about how the United Nations works, knows that there are, you know, there are five countries that have veto powers in the United Nations. However, um, at this point, so typically, so you'd think the, United, the USSR should have vetoed the resolution. However, at this point in time, the USSR was boycotting UN meetings over a previous issue over allowing communist China to join the, the United Nations. And they were therefore not present at the meetings to use their veto power. So funnily enough, one of the main flaws of the UN in this particular moment did not come to fruition because the, the USSR was basically boycotting the United Nations because of this situation. So we're going to run through two things. We're going to run through a series of the key events of the Korean War and then briefly go over how far it is a success or a failure for containment. And as you can see, it's mostly a success. So um, the phases of the Korean War are fairly straightforward. This map over here gives you the four key phases of the war, which I'll run through fairly quickly. Um, so the first phase of the war is between June and September 1915. This is basically when the northern communists under Kim Il-sung invade the south. And as you can see from that first map, okay, the north quickly overwhelms and takes over and occupies most of the south and, the, and all the Korean peninsula. This one area, Pusan, is the only place that is not occupied and conquered by the North Koreans. Because of the speed of the conquest, this is why the Americans are so desperate to get involved, because they can see Korea is literally about to be fully conquered. Okay, so in September 1950, that is when the UN resolution is passed, and almost immediately afterwards, preparations are made to start sending troops over, which happens fairly quickly. So UN forces are landed in two separate locations in Korea, um, one called, well, one being Pusan over here, and the other at a place called Incheon further north. Um, and when these troops land, they are able to quickly start pushing the North Korean forces back and push them back beyond the 38th parallel within a matter of weeks. So by October 1950, this is now the map of Korea. They've pushed the communists back, and they've also now pushed deep into North Korea. So the situation has now flipped completely against the North Koreans. So this is then where you think, wow, okay, they've achieved their objective, containment has been achieved. This is when, had they stopped here, it would have been undoubtedly a success and it would have looked very, very good potentially as an outcome. However, despite the initial objective being achieved, the UN forces being directed by two people, first of all, Harry Truman, and also the general in charge of the army is an American general called Douglas MacArthur, who's a rabid anti-communist. They decide, actually, why settle for containment when instead we can actually push further north and potentially um, remove communists from Korea entirely. And so they push further north. And again, if you look at the map, they're pretty successful. Um, however, this decision has a fateful consequence. Um, Pushing so far into the north has the consequence that Kim Il-sung thought it would when he thought the Americans thought it would not intervene in Korea, and that is provoke the Chinese. Now, as you can see from this map over here, China is basically bordered with Korea. So when they push so far north, the Chinese feel threatened by this and decide to cross the border and intervene in the war backing the North Koreans, okay? The Chinese send 200,000 soldiers across the border, many of whom are trained veterans who had fought in the Chinese Civil War and also being from that region were much more adept at fighting in the kind of marshy areas and mountainous regions um, that where a lot of the fighting was taking place in the Korean War. And so when this army now comes in, as we can see in map number three, they are then able to overwhelm the United Nations forces and quickly push them back into South Korea. And as you can see from the map, they again managed to clear the 30th parallel and push once again into South Korea. Now, at this point, Truman accepts that containment and protection of South Korea was good enough and decides to call it quits there. However, MacArthur is basically triggered and is like, hell no. And so, MacArthur believes that they have to punish China. 
And MacArthur thinks that America should actually invade and attack China. In fact, he even publicly calls for China to be nuked with an atom bomb, okay? Um, in response to the situation, to try and push them back. And Truman's basically like, this guy is insane. So he sacks MacArthur and, and has him recalled home and refuses to follow along with his plan. And instead, the US strategy reverts back to um, containment and settling for a return to the status, the status quo from before the Korean War. And so for the next few months, there is a bit of a stalemate around the 38th parallel with but no sides kind of making any major gains or really attempting to push too deeply into the territories of the other. And at this point, both sides do kind of accept that that's what's going to have to happen. And so they enter into peace talks, which take, which take a couple of years to agree. Um, and a couple of years later, you get an armistice being signed. Um, and effectively, the armistice um, reverts the situation back to what it was like before the war. The, the border itself is slightly altered. It's no longer this straight line of the 38th parallel. It is instead a slightly more um, meaningful border that kind of follows the rough terrain of the region. Um, but essentially, the end result of the war is a return to the status quo before the war. Um, so, in terms of those outcomes, how far is this a success or a failure for containment? On the whole, you have to say the Korean War is basically a success, okay? It could have gone a little bit better, but if we consider the stated aim of the United States from the beginning of the conflict was to contain communism and protect the South from falling to communism. And in that sense, they're successful, okay? They halt the invasion, um, which at one point looked like it was going to be totally successful and then and the, the peninsula was gonna be reunited under communism. Um, and so it is a successful example of containment. Secondly, another important aspect of it is it showed the world that the United States was willing to confront communism by force, okay? This was arguably a trigger of the Korean War in the first place. Kim, um, Kim Il-sung invades South Korea because he thinks the United States are just all talk when it comes to containment and will not actually do anything. So this action in many respects should ideally deter similar actions by communists elsewhere because it showed that containment had a bite, okay, to kind of back up the bar, so to speak. So on the whole, it is quite successful, to be honest. However, if you were to receive a 10 mark question about overall success of the Korean War, there are a couple of arguments you could make to say it wasn't so successful. Um, the first, as you could say, although this technically isn't containment, it's technically rollback, um, for the purpose of an exam, you can make this point and an examiner will accept it, okay? Trust me. Um, the US failed to achieve their later expanded aims of reuniting Korea. Truman and MacArthur wanted to reunite the entire peninsula later on, and that policy basically failed because um, the Chinese intervened and they foiled this plot and the future threat of the North remained as a result. Okay, so you can also argue that the threat to the South from the North continues even until this day. And so containment was not really solved in the long term because the North Koreans are still kind of trying to undermine the South. The second point you can make, this is less relevant to containment, you'd mention it more if it was a question of success and failure in general, is that the conflict kind of exposed major tensions between key US decision makers um, over foreign policy, okay? And so MacArthur is sacked over the situation and he kind of receives his heroic welcome when he, when he returns. The public sort of backs him. Uh, many in the government back MacArthur, but others don't. And so you have this public expo expo exposing of this division between the exists and, and at the upper echelons of the US government. And so it isn't the greatest issue in the world, but if you were, if you were writing a 10 mark essay, you need counter arguments, that's a point you could potentially make. Okay, um, so on the whole, it's a fairly successful example of containment. So that's Korea in a nutshell. Of the three case studies, it's the shortest, and so for that reason, it's taken me a little bit less to get through it. The next two case studies are a little bit longer. And the next one, is also quite different in terms of the nature of the crisis and the conflict and also the significance. Uh, so the second case study of containment is the Cuban Missile Crisis um, of 1962. Now, the Cuban Missile Crisis is the most famous and significant, arguably, of all Cold War confrontations, okay? Um, and it's 
the most famous of what we call kind of the Cold War close calls, where the United States and the USSR almost, almost come to all-out war or go, go potentially declare all-out war on each other. And so um, this, in this incident, tensions between the US and the USSR reached the most dangerous level they had ever reached in the entirety of the Cold War. During a 13-day period, okay, of the 13 day period of the Cuban Missile Crisis, October 1962. So October 1962 is the high point of US-USSR tension throughout the entirety of the Cold War. And it is, to be honest, the closest that we have ever come as a people, as you should know, because you should have done this already in class, um, to an all-out war and a potentially apocalyptic nuclear war. Um, hence why it's, this, it's the basis of a lot of movies and all kinds of other exciting documentaries. Um, it's a fascinating incident, basically. Um, so, for this topic, you need to know about, first of all, the relationship between the US and Cuba and why this, why this kind of tension develops in the first place, and then how it leads to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and again, the same issue of the outcomes for the Americans. Was it a success or was it a failure for them? So, I'm going to start off by going over the background to the relationship between the United States and Cuba. Okay? And so, you need to understand, basically, that, first of all, if you look at a map, I haven't got one here, Cuba is basically just off the coast of Florida, okay? I think, if I'm not mistaken, Cuba is the closest, I mean, if you discount the countries that America has land borders with, in other words, Mexico and Canada, um, Cuba is the third, Cuba is the closest country to America in the world, okay? It's just off the coast of Florida, so much so that sometimes people, exiles fleeing Cuba, will try to swim from Cuba to Florida. They often die in the process, but it's, it's physically possible to reach um, Miami or Florida by swimming from Cuba. So we're talking about essentially America's backyard in the Caribbean. So in terms of the history of Cuba, Cuba is a Spanish colony up until 1898 when they gain independence from Spain. However, where in the, as part of the treaties where Cuba gains independence and after Cuba gains independence, they quickly come under significant economic influence and political control of the US. They are not technically a colony of the US, but they might as well be, because their economy is controlled by the US almost entirely, and the government also is essentially close to a puppet government of the United States. And there's a few key reasons for this in terms of the relationship. The first thing is the US is a key buyer of Cuba's main raw export, which is sugar. Okay, so the Cubans rely upon the Americans to buy sugar from them for their own, you know, economic income, so to speak. Secondly, as a result, America is Cuba's main source of manufactured goods and imports. So most of the stuff that Cuba imports and they purchase, they purchase from the U.S. Arguably not, okay, arguably against their will, because the U.S. is kind of forcing it upon them. Additionally. The U U.S. companies were heavily involved in Cuba and owned most major companies, okay? So the agricultural sector, banks, um, hotels, major businesses, etc., were owned largely by U.S. companies. Agriculture in particular, I think it's something like three quarters of all agricultural land in Cuba was owned by American companies, okay? So economically, they are under significant control of the U.S. Additionally, the country also essentially becomes the naughty playground of rich U.S. businessmen, okay? So if you're a rich U.S. businessman who wants to have like a, you know, a fun weekend away doing, you know, seedy, dodgy things, then you go to Cuba and you do it, okay? Um, if you ever watched The Godfather Part Two, great film, by the way, um, the middle part of the film, they're basically in Cuba, and you see what kinds of stuff American businessmen get up to in, in, in the country. And on that point, it's worth noting as well um, that Cuba had also become a really key oper base of operations for a lot of American organized crime gangs, Italian mafia, etc. Um, and the Cuban government is basically complicit in this. The Cuban government, under a man called um, Fulgencio Batista, well, later on Batista, but people, there were others before him, but later on there's a guy called Batista, were essentially puppets of the US and complicit in what was happening. And the US, to be honest, would not allow anybody to take power in Cuba unless they were going to further the interests of the United States. Also, also, worth, also worth mentioning that this very corrupt government was a brutal dictatorship, okay? As you can imagine, in a country where most people are poor, 
and essentially is looking after the interests of rich foreign businessmen, not their own people, people are very, very unhappy and oppose the government. And the Cuban government puts down and keeps control through repression and by putting these people down by force, okay? And this is, this is used increasingly as the population becomes increasingly discontented due to the poverty they are living in as a result. So, as a result, in 1959, the Batista regime, which was the pro-American puppet regime, um, was forcibly overthrown by a socialist revolutionary known as Fidel Castro. This is one of the real kind of legendary figures of the 20th century, um, a very, very, very interesting individual. Um, his background is a very unique one as well in terms of his social class and all that. Um, we don't have time to go into it now, it's worth looking to yourself. Um, but he's basically kind of an educated middle class lawyer who, you know, gets disenchanted with the nature of the regime and leads a revolution, mainly peasant led revolution. Um, so, this man, Fidel Castro, when he comes to power, he promises to restore power to the people and to end the American controlled corruption and actually help people live better and more dignified lives. Now, it's worth mentioning Fidel Castro is not. Soviet linked. He is in many respects independent of the USSR, okay? This is not the USSR spreading communism into Cuba. In many ways, in fact, the USSR would not have risked promoting a communist revolution on the US's doorstep, given this would have likely provoked the Americans, okay? So the USSR, especially under their new leader Khrushchev, would not have taken such a risky measure, okay? So he is independent of the USSR. Um, so, soon after taking over, he does what socialists and communists do. First thing being is, he nationalizes foreign-owned companies, okay? So, all those American companies that existed in Cuba and the, and the resources they had, the Cuban government takes over those resources, okay? In particular, for example, the agricultural land. The agricultural land is taken from all the foreign companies and it is redistributed to the peasants of Cuba. Okay, to take one example. As you can guess, this is something the Americans are not happy about at all. So the Americans immediately want to remove Castro from power, thinking this is a temporary blip, we'll get rid of this guy and things will go back to normal. So they respond by imposing economic sanctions on Cuba, meaning they stop all trade with them. Now, given we've already mentioned that Cuba's economy relies upon trade with America, in particular America buying their sugar, this is a massive economic, well, this is a massive blow rather to the economy of Cuba, okay? The US was their largest trade partner by far, and so now the Cubans have nobody to deal with. This point is when Castro starts to form his relationship with the Soviet Union. The irony is, when Castro comes to power, despite his policies, he actually wants to maintain some kind of relationship with the Americans because he's not stupid. He realizes it's in his best interest to have some sort of good relationship. But that was a bit naive, to be honest, thinking he could do what he did without um, the Americans running the way that they did. So this basically pushes Castro into the arms of a country that will happily step in to back him financially, and that is the Soviet Union, okay? So the new Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, used sees an opportunity to step in and help support Cuba. So they start off by signing a $100 million trade agreement whereby Cuba will now, sorry, um, the USSR will now buy Cuba's sugar, for example, okay? Um, which the Americans kind of don't really bank on happening, but it's what happens. Um, and so a few months later, um, the Americans are not going to give up, but the new American leader, what's in new, he's been in charge for a few years now, a guy called Eisenhower, um, approves a plan to formally try to overthrow Castro and remove him by force, okay? The Americans have no intention of letting this slide, and again, they still believe this is a temporary blip, and there is no chance in hell they are going to simply stand by and watch a country on their doorstep go communist and become closely allied to the Soviet Union, okay? So this takes us into the first major incident of the well, what happens in, in Cuba, okay? And it is an event you may remember the name of, um, it is famously called the Bay of Pigs incident. Okay, um, so the Bay of Pigs is 
a massive blunder, a uh, pretty funny blunder actually by the Americans um, in 1961. So a new US president comes into play, comes in, John F. Kennedy, okay? He's the youngest year of US president ever until that point. He inherits all the same issues of previous US governments, including how to deal with Cuba. One of the first things he inherits, and imagine he's this young president who's not very experienced, okay? Um, and on his desk, he has put on, you know, in front of him, um, this issue of this plan that Eisenhower's government had been putting together over how to overthrow the Castro government and remove communism from Cuba. And so Kennedy basically pushes ahead with the plan that Eisenhower's government had, draw, had drawn up. But they make some small, they make some key changes to the, to the um, plan, okay? So the plan was that they would train Cuban exiles, okay, people who were against Castro who fled from Cuba to America, um, and they would land them in Cuba, supported by US airstrikes, okay, which would then help to overthrow Castro and install um, a new government. However, Kennedy makes a couple of crucial changes. Kennedy is really desperate to ensure that the Americans, in the event that this goes wrong, can maintain plausible deniability. In other words, they can claim they weren't involved in it. So he has a couple of decisions he makes. Number one, he scales back the initial extent of the airstrikes and also wants the planes to be painted as Cuban Air Force planes to make it look like it's Cuban planes, which is a bit of a dumb idea, to be honest. Um, and then he also chooses to relocate the landing spot of the Cubans, of the exiles, to an isolated beach known as the Bay of Pigs, okay? So the plan ends up being an embarrassing failure. Number one, the US failed to control the air and take out the Cuban Air Force because Kennedy has scaled back the airstrikes. So that's one of the reasons. Um, secondly, and more importantly, the exiles were unable to land as they were immediately fired upon and were expected by the Cuban defenders due to the poor secrecy of the plans. So the Cubans knew about it beforehand, essentially. And so they can't land in the Bay of Pigs. And it's basically a complete disaster. These guys then captured and paraded on TV. Um, and it's a humiliation. And it's an international humiliation for the Americans. Um, and Castro, further from being you know, weak and removed from power, this actually further entrenches his position. And he becomes more popular due to, due to his repelling of the American invasion. And here's the real killer blow for Kennedy. Despite attempting to hide their involvement, it was bleedingly obvious that this was the US, it was a US plan, that there's the US behind this, okay? Um, and it was also obvious, because of the whole painting the planes, that the US had tried to hide their involvement. So it was obvious that it was, a, it was a terrible plan. People knew the US tried to, that the US tried to hide their involvement, and that, they were sort of, that, that it was the US plan involved in it, and they tried to hold their, hide their involvement, okay? So this has some important consequences for um, Kennedy. And you can get asked six mark questions about the importance of the Bay of Pigs. And there are two main things you can mention here if you had a six mark with the Bay of Pigs. So number one, the Bay of Pigs invasion makes Kennedy look really weak. Now, he is already, as a young president, the youngest ever, um, he has question marks over his experience and judgment, as you always have, have with new young leaders. This failure hurts his image even more, okay? Um, because of the fact that um, it just looks so amateurish. Additionally, because of the half-hearted nature of it and how they try to hide their involvement, it makes it look to Castro and Khrushchev in particular, the US USSR leader, that he is weak and easy to push around. That's an impression people often have of young leaders. You know, even today, if you look at political debates, and there's a young person running for prime minister or president, they'll ask them, you know, how will you deal with Putin and, you know, these tough world leaders? Um, so when you then, your first foreign policy engagement is this embarrassing humiliation, it compounds that impression. That's the first consequence. The second consequence is, and this is the really important one, this deepens the USSR-Cuba alliance even further. Now, initially, the USSR-Cuba alliance had been purely economic, okay? Castro needed somebody to buy his sugar, okay? And that's what their trade agreement was. Um, so Castro needed somebody to buy his sugar, and that's what their trade agreement was, okay? The USSR 
had been, now after this point, the USSR starts to arm Cuba militarily, okay? Castro feels really paranoid about an invasion because of what's just happened, okay? So he wants now the USSR to give him weapons to feel secure against a US invasion because he is expecting a, another US invasion or is expecting further plots by the Americans to try and overthrow their government. Um, so um, the, 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 the USSR had already been arming the Cubans, but lightly and secretly. After the Bay of Pigs, they massively step up the amount of weapons they are sending to the, the Cubans and they announce it publicly, okay? As a result, the USSR makes Cuba the best equipped Latin American army, the Cuban army, the best equipped army militarily, obviously military, um, in Latin America. So they're sending them things like missiles, tanks, jet bombers, jet fighters, patrol boats, everything basically. It's a very, very well equipped army. And so these are the two major impacts or significant impacts of the, of the Bay of Pigs or incident, if you were to get a question about that. Um, so this leads us directly into the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the US, as you can imagine, you have warning signals firing off, okay, in you know, their HQ over the situation, okay? It's now gone from bad to worse. Not only have we lost Cuba, they've now joined the USSR, and they're now being armed militarily by the USSR. However, as long as the arming remained, in term, remained conventional weapons only, conventional meaning not nuclear weapons, not chemical weapons, you know, regular weapons, um, then they could tolerate the situation. The real alarm and danger comes in September 1962. You start to get reports emerging in the US, okay, amongst you know, the intelligence services, that nuclear missiles are being potentially brought to Cuba. On the 14th of October, 1962, an American spy plane famously for going over Cuba and the missile sites takes some very detailed photographs over missile sites in Cuba. And these photographs, when they're checked out, confirm the US's worst fears. The USSR had in fact begun to send nuclear missiles to Cuba and was building nuclear missile sites in Cuba. And this discovery is what kicks off the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I'm gonna run through um, why, the, why the Soviet Union put missiles there in the first place. I'm then gonna go over the events of the missile crisis in summary, because it can be a bit complicated. I'm just gonna go over the key points and then go over who won the crisis, the Americans or the Soviet Union, and how we can argue that. So why does Khrushchev put missiles in Cuba? So it's worth mentioning before kind of going into this. This is an extremely reckless decision, okay? It's not even particularly secret. I mean, it kind of is, but they don't take much. They don't try that hard to cover up what's happening. So it looks like Khrushchev kind of wanted the Americans to know what was happening at some point. This is a very reckless thing to do, okay? You're potentially causing war here. Why on earth would he do this? So there's a couple of reasons, basically. The first thing is he's doing it to defend Cuba. This is the basic reason, okay? So I've already mentioned how um, the Americans um, or the Cubans and the Soviets feel paranoid over a potential um, further attempt by the Americans to remove the, the government in Cuba, okay? For the USSR, the Cuban Revolution was an unexpected gift, okay? They literally have a country without any effort on the, of their own flipping towards communism on the United States' doorstep, okay? Khrushchev knew the Americans would never let the situation go to rest and would always try to overthrow them, okay? So for him, this was a way to take drastic action to protect Cuba and to stop the US from making further serious attempts to overthrow the communist government in Cuba. So that's the first reason. The second reason is more complicated and you need to understand how nuclear weapon technology works and the strategic, the strategic situation in, 19, in 1961. The second reason is to close something called the missile gap. So by 1950, the 1950s rather, nuclear technology has massively developed, okay? We have two things, we've got um, we've got, we've now got much bigger nuclear weapons compared to the 
early generation. So you now have hydrogen bombs, for example, or bombs that can um, have far greater explosion radiuses than the ones that were dropped in Japan in 1945. Secondly, and more importantly, unlike the early, genera early generation of bombs that had to be flown over a country directly, they now have created missile technology where you can put warheads on a missile and fire it towards another country from a very, very long distance. Here's the thing. With regards to missiles, there was a significant gap whereby the US was far superior to the USSR in terms of their stockpile. Specifically, the US had a much greater number of long-range, what we call intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs, okay? Um, these are missiles that could travel up to 10,000 kilometers, okay? So the US could strike the, the Soviet Union from a lot of places across the world. Additionally, the US had also placed nuclear missiles in Europe um, because they had allied countries like, you know, Germany, whatever, um, Turkey, etc. And these missiles were pointing at the USSR, okay? So they had shorter range missiles, but they had places in Europe to place them in. So short range missiles, both the US and the USSR had a very similar number, okay? But the USSR did not have anywhere to place them, okay, compared to... Um, compared to the Americans who had all these different allies in Europe. So this gift of Cuba becoming a communist country meant that Khrushchev now had a place where he could put missiles in the same way the Americans had to threaten the Americans. This is important because basically what you need to understand is, is that in nuclear war, the idea is both countries will be destroyed, so that's not going to happen. However, this relies upon the, on, on the on both sides having enough power to wipe out the others. In 1961, okay, or 62, it was still to some degree viable that America could start nuclear war against the Soviet Union and potentially win and survive. The Soviets would still get some nukes off, okay, and do some damage, but on balance, the situation was such that America could, could fight the Soviet Union in a nuclear war and destroy them and themselves somehow survive. And you actually see, you, can, you, you read this in accounts of people who are in government, there are many generals who believed that nuclear war was inevitable with the Soviet Union and that America might as well do it now when they can still potentially win than later on when the gap has been shrunk. So for the Soviet Union, they desperately needed to shrink the missile gap to mean to, so that the, the two sides actually had parity in order to actually protect themselves. And putting nuclear missiles in Cuba was a way of achieving this, okay? This would very much deter the Americans from the Soviet perspective from starting war against the Soviet Union. The third reason is, and this is a lesser important reason, but you could say it's a, it's a key reason, is Khrushchev wants to bargain with the USA, basically, okay? He wants to extract concessions from the US. And putting missiles in Cuba and then letting the Americans kind of know about it is giving himself a bargaining chip to use. This is arguably further encouraged by Kennedy's indecision and weakness with the Bay of Pigs invasion or incident, okay? As we've already mentioned, Khrushchev thought Kennedy was weak and he could basically push him around. So what's Kennedy's response to this blockade? So when Kennedy finds out about the missiles, it's really not a very easy situation. In fact, for poor Kennedy, who is this still inexperienced leader, it's a really tough decision, okay? He does not have many attractive options available to him. Now, the thing is, Kennedy is absolutely determined to not back down, okay? This is arguably even more so due to his already weakened international standing because of the, the, the Bay of Pigs incident, and he believes the missiles have to be removed, like absolutely must be removed, okay? That is a red line. There is no situation they can accept in which the missiles stay there. However, the two most guaranteed ways to achieve this is via airstrikes on Cuba or an invasion of Cuba, both of which would almost certainly lead to an all-out war with the USSR. So what is Kennedy to do? To do? So since he settles on the idea of a blockade of the island, or as they call it, a quarantine zone. Okay, so when he has his press conference announcing the discovery of missiles, they call it a quarantine zone. Okay, the idea is 
that they would block any Soviet ships from bringing weapons to the island. What would happen is, if a Soviet ship was going to approach the quarantine zone, they would have to be stopped and searched by American ships for any weapons, and they'd be turned back if they had weapons, basically. Um, and so this is the solution that Kennedy settles on. However, um, so yeah, so, so 22nd of, of 22nd of October is when Kennedy gives his famous press conference to the American people where he announces the discovery of missiles and also announces the blockade. The main advantage of the blockade as a solution is that it would stop the Soviet Union from bringing further equipment to Cuba, okay? And it would also show a firm stance, so he's not being weak, but without actually declaring war. Now, this situation could still cause war, but what it is doing is essentially this is a game of chicken, okay, or like a staring contest. The question is who will blink first, okay? So essentially, well, it's like a tennis match. He's now putting the ball in the other side's court, and it's like, okay, your turn now. What are you gonna do next? So he's now giving Khrushchev the decision of whether or not he backs down or potentially causes war, okay? So if war is gonna happen, it's gonna be Khrushchev who declares war in this instance. And to actually test his resolve and see if he would in fact take that very you know, risky and bold step. So the Soviet Union has the option of ignoring the blockade and trying to force their way through. This would, however, be an act of war, okay? Um, so on the one hand, this is a problem because you could still have war, but it's not their decision if that's what happens. Secondly, the other issue, however, is this does not solve the problem of the missiles already on the island. So what happens in the crisis? So we've got basically two main stages of the crisis. There's the first stage where it's about the blockade and the approaching Soviet ships coming to the blockade. The second part is what happens after that. So the first four days of the crisis, or once it's, and the blockade is announced, the 12th of October, Khrushchev sends a letter to Kennedy saying he would not observe the blockade, and the US, as a result, draws up plans and mobilizes soldiers for the invasion of, or an invasion of Cuba, as do, as do the USSR. So both sides mobilize for war, okay? And Khrushchev says, I don't care about your blockade, we're going through it, okay? So if, if, he, if he's true to his word, then war will break out. So both sides, obviously, are preparing for war. A day later, there are Soviet ships bringing nuclear missiles and weapons approaching the blockade zone, okay, or the quarantine zone. And this is when you got our first major tense moment of the crisis when things could have gone south very quickly. The, the ships are approaching the blockade with apparently no intention of stopping and basically causing a, a nuclear incident potentially. Um, however, at the last minute, it is the Soviets who blink first and the ships are ordered to turn back and observe the blockade, okay? So first part of the crisis goes to Kennedy, the Soviets back off. However, this is not the end of the crisis. A day later, there are new photos taken by American spy planes that show that the missile base building is rapidly speeding up and is proceeding according to the USSR plan, okay? And the US, as a result, raises the DEFCON level to two. The DEFCON level is the nuclear war preparedness, essentially. Um, essentially, it's one step in terms of preparation level before all-out nuclear war. And it's the only time in history that Def, that I think they've reached DEFCON 2 before. Um, so it's again looking like the Americans will have to invade Cuba to take out the missiles, because what else are they going to do? On 30th of October, Khrushchev kind of senses this, and you can kind of see that Khrushchev himself really did not want to go to war and was trying to look for an escape. He realizes, maybe I've overplayed my hand. Kennedy isn't as much of a pushover as I thought. He's like, oh crap, what can I, I need to find an escape route here. So he sends a letter to JFK promising to remove the missiles if the US promises not to invade Cuba. This is significantly the first time he actually admits there are missiles actually on the island in the first place. And so the crisis appears to be de-escalating on the 26th of October. However, a day later, again a day later, Khrushchev sends a second letter to Kennedy. This time it's more threatening in tone, threatening to you know, kind of blow up America if they don't agree and whatever. And he also revises his demands, saying he also wants all US missiles in Turkey to be removed, okay? Because the US had missiles in Turkey pointing at the Soviet Union. Later that same day, 
an American U-2 spy plane is shot down over Cuba and the pilot is killed. This is now the high point of tension of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy is advised by many of his advisors on the XCOM committee that you know, are dealing with this crisis um, to immediately retaliate and launch an invasion of Cuba the next day. Okay? And if you listen to kind of reports by people who were on the, on, in, in XCOM and if you, you, know, you listen to recordings of it, this was argued for strongly. And you're kind of hearing Kennedy's voice, him considering it quite seriously. So you think of it as having, you know, he was never going to do that. Kennedy is actually considering just attacking Cuba, okay? However, he chooses instead to listen to the advice of this one ex-Soviet ambassador um, or American ambassador to the Soviet Union who knew Khrushchev. And he basically tells Kennedy, look, ignore the first letter, sorry, this is the second letter, and, and, and respond to the first one. Khrushchev is looking for a way out of this. Give him a way out. And Kennedy decides to ignore the advice of the generals and the other individuals on, 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 on XCOM, and he instead follows this guy's advice. He ignores the second letter, and he replies to Khrushchev by accepting the first letter. He then also adds his little threat, saying he'll invade the Soviet Union, sorry, he'll invade Cuba if the Soviets not withdraw their missiles. A day later, Khrushchev responds to the letter, agreeing to the terms, and begins to dismantle and return the missiles to the Soviet Union, bringing the crisis to an end. And so war is averted at the last minute through some diplomacy, basically. Um, and it's when you look into the details, there are some other details that I've skipped over. It's kind of, it's really, really interesting in terms of the back and forth and how close they got. So I, I do recommend you watching a document, any, any kind of donk, documentary about it, which goes over the, the specific details of, the, of each day, because it, it really is quite a scary incident. But if we look at the big overall question for us, which is who actually wins the crisis? Okay, so I'm gonna go over the outcomes for the US and the outcomes for the USA. So um, for the USA, we can say that it is a huge personal victory for Kennedy, okay? This is a guy who had had a pretty rough time when he first was president, the Bay of Pigs is a bit of a disaster. And so this is a, is a huge personal victory that sees his reputation and standing massively improve on a global level, okay? And also on, on the national level in the US, he's much more respected. He had made Khrushchev back down and he had publicly won the crisis by achieving the missile removal and he stood up to the hardliners in his own government and did things his way, okay? Not their kind of aggressive way. However, in private, the crisis was a bit more even, okay? The US secretly agreed to remove the missiles from Turkey as part of an agreement with Khrushchev. And also, Cuba, he had promised to allow to remain a communist country and to not invade, okay? And so Cuba remains a communist country and remains this thorn in the side of the US. This is a huge challenge for containment. As Cuba becomes the main base from which communism is promoted throughout Latin America, Communism and revolutions constantly spread and are threatened across the, the continent in the next few decades. And in many ways, it's because of the base in Cuba from which it is being spread. So actually, long term, it actually hurts containment because of the fact that it stays communist and they start to spread communism into other parts of South America. For Khrushchev, he's able to portray himself as the protector of Cuba and having you know, kept them safe in the long term. Um, this is a very this is hugely valuable for the Soviet for the Soviet Union, as Cuba, as I've already mentioned in the previous slide, was a useful base which they could spread communism in Latin America. So this is kind of the opposite point to the previous point about um, Kennedy, you know, having to let Cuba remain communist. Addition, however, um, sorry. Additionally, strategically, you can argue the Soviet Union wins the missile crisis. If we look at the situation at the start of the missile crisis, at the end of it the Soviet Union is actually in a better position, okay? Because they managed to get the Turkish missiles removed, which is strategically a victory for them. However, it is not a total victory because they, are, they have to keep it secret. And so the USSR is not able to make any propaganda value out of this part of the victory, okay? Lastly, this is a humiliation for the USSR because publicly it looks like a defeat. You put the missiles there and you had clearly backed down and came away looking weaker. So 
it, basically, he looks poor, to be honest. And it really hurts Khrushchev standing back home. And it just, the, it's just not a good look for, the, for them. So publicly, it's a clear defeat for the, for, the, for the Soviet Union. But in some ways, it is a more balanced overall um, situation. Okay, so if you get a 10-mark question about the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's most likely going to be about who won, okay? And those are the main arguments you can use back and forth for either the American side or the Cuban side. This then takes us into our third case study, okay? And this is the greatest humiliation the US Army has ever suffered, basically, in its history, arguably. So, poor Kennedy can't catch a break. As the Cuban Missile Crisis winds down, the Kennedy government begins to increasingly involve the US in the most famous and culturally significant conflict of the Cold War. That is the war in Vietnam. The war in Vietnam is arguably the most disastrous foreign policy, foreign policy decision-making in US history, okay? The war deeply divides, um, the war deeply divides the Soviet Union, sorry, the, um, the US, and it is a clear-cut failure, as we will see, um, in the policy of containment. So, as with Korea, I'm going to do a similar thing. I'm going to go over the backgrounds why there's a war happening here. I'm then going to go over the events of the Vietnam War in summary. But I'm going to kind of summarize things a little bit because it's a super complicated event. And we haven't got anywhere near enough time to go over it in full detail. Okay? What I would say is, I would strongly recommend you watch some documentaries about it. A is quite interesting, to be honest, so it's quite, it's quite, it's quite good to do that. Um, but it just help you understand the conflict a lot more because it can be quite a confusing issue. Um, if you've got a lot of time to spare, there's the Ken Burns documentary on Netflix, The Vietnam War. It's like 12 hours long, but honestly, it's a phenomenal documentary series and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, but so I'm just going to go over a short summary. But if you want a really deep understanding of the, career, of the, of the Vietnam War, the documentary is phenomenal. So back onto the Vietnam War. In many ways, the Vietnam War has a lot of similarities with the war in Korea. Okay? Um, so Vietnam was a French colony. In other words, it was part of a French colony called Indochina, which also included Laos and Cambodia, um, historically. In the Second World War, the French get wrecked, um, and their colonies are occupied by either the Germans or the Japanese. And so the French colonies in the East are occupied by Japan, including Indochina. Okay? And so the Japanese are resisted by a movement called the Viet Minh. Okay? This is a national liberation movement, but it's kind of communist because it's led by a communist revolutionary called Ho Chi Minh. Okay? But to be honest, Ho Chi Minh is more of a nationalist figure than he is kind of a hardcore communist. And this is something I'm going to come, I'm going to come back to later on. He is a communist, but he is not this super hardcore ideological communist in the way that the Americans will put, will kind, of, will kind of see him as. So when the Japanese are defeated, Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh um, enter Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam, and declare Vietnam independent. The French, however, have other ideas, and they intend to return and reestablish control over Indochina, okay? And so here's the thing. The Vietnam War technically begins almost immediately after the Second World War. Now, in reality, it's more afterwards, after it becomes independent. But there is basically war in Vietnam from the end of the Second World War right up until 1975. There is basically almost 30 years of war in Vietnam, okay, in some way, shape, or form. So the French come back and want to reestablish control over, over Vietnam. But the Viet Minh are like, obviously, um, no, we're not going to accept that. So the Viet Minh fight the French. The French being useless, especially after the Second World War, um, they've been financially weakened and having to fight a very, very long way away in the East. Um, the Viet Minh are able to gain the upper hand. And despite financial backing from the United States, okay, who are getting involved in Vietnam, because despite their dislike of European empires, it turns out the Americans fear a communist takeover of Vietnam more than they dislike French colonial rule. Um, the French are eventually defeated by the Viet Minh in a famous battle called the Battle of Diem, Diem Phu. Um, the French army is crushed by a Vietnamese um, ambush um, or a Viet Minh ambush. 
and the French are basically forced to accept defeat in the war and they give up and begin negotiations with the Viet Minh. Negotiations begin immediately after the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. And in July 1954, France signs the Geneva Peace Accords with the Viet Minh, which first of all declares Vietnam independent. But here's the key part, and this is where things are now going to sound very, very similar to Korea. Vietnam is temporarily divided into two parts, North and South. And this temporary division would last until internationally supervised elections could take place two years later. So the schedule was 1956, okay? Um, and that would decide the government of Vietnam, which would then become unified. However, it is clear as day that if elections were to take place in Vietnam, they would be won pretty comfortably by the communists. And the Americans, the great defenders of democracy and liberty, um, decide, you know what, democracy is not a great idea um, if it ends up in communists winning and taking over countries. So the Americans decide they will not allow elections to take place. So um, they install a government in place in the south of Vietnam, or rather they support the new South Vietnamese government to become independent. And Vietnam is formally divided into two countries. There is a North Vietnam and a South Vietnam, okay? Same as Korea. Like the Korean War, okay? <clears throat> so the Vietnam War is not a conflict started by the Americans. It is a war between two sides of a divided country the North and the South, a war in which the Americans choose to get involved in. But in the case of Vietnam, they get involved much more gradually compared to what happened in Korea, okay? And this is why the Vietnam War is much more confusing compared to the Korean War, okay? So North Vietnam was controlled by the communist Viet Minh, whereas the South was governed by a staunchly and rapidly anti-communist dictator called No Din Diem. I don't know how the first part is pronounced, but his second name is Diem. Uh, Vietnamese names are very difficult to pronounce, notoriously. So, Diem's regime was extremely unpopular with the Vietnamese people in the South, okay? Basically, he was the wrong leader for South Vietnam. If you wanted to make the country viable, okay, he was not the person you needed to back, okay? He was one of these wealthy elites in a country mostly for, made up of poor peasants. He was a Catholic, who despised Buddhism, which happened to be the majority religion of the country, okay? So he does a lot of things that offend the most people in the country and actually kind of takes actions that, you know, upset most of the people. Um, he's very, very corrupt, and he's very, very harsh in his repression of opponents, including mostly communists, okay? The thing is, the Americans knew that Ziem was a problematic leader, okay, and had issues but they felt they had no choice but to back him, okay? It's him or nobody. And if we don't back him, the communists will take over, and that's the worst case scenario. So the Americans find themselves propping up the government of a terrible leader, who they know is terrible, but they feel they have no choice but to back him. So what actually is the Vietnam War? Which may seem like a very strange question, but people can often be confused with what the Vietnam War actually is. So I'm gonna run through just a few basic details of who's waging the war and what that war actually looks like. So the actions of the Ziem government leads to increased rebellion and armed struggle by groups against the government, okay? Mostly communist groups, okay? Or people who join the communists because they are against Ziem, not so much because they're died in the war communists, okay? These actions and rebellions intensify over the course of the next few years. And by 1959, the North Vietnamese government had begun to fund and give significant military assistance to these rebels, okay? This group is known as the Viet Cong, okay? And it's made up of South Vietnamese people who oppose the government, as well as communists from the North under the orders of the Viet Minh, okay? So the Vietnam War, unlike the Korean War, the North does not invade the South. The Vietnam War is a guerrilla war by a group called the Viet Cong who are inside South Vietnam to try and overthrow the government of the South. However, the backing and training and in some ways leadership of the Viet Cong does come from North Vietnam, but it is not North Vietnam invading the South. And this is a crucial 
crucial difference between Vietnam and Korea. The Korea War is a conventional war. The South invades, the North invades the South, the Americans can just land in there and fight them back. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a conventional war. The Viet Cong wages a guerrilla war. Okay, if you don't know this already, then you need to know this now. Guerrilla wars are notoriously difficult to fight, okay? It's asymmetric warfare. It is not two sides fighting on a battlefield in a pitched battle, okay? It is one side, the guerrillas, choosing when and how to engage with their opponents, okay? And if you're the side fighting against the guerrillas, it is notoriously difficult to fight back against them because they're not anywhere to be found officially. They have no official base operations, okay? They hide out amongst ordinary people. And there's something which we're gonna, gonna come back to later on. So the Viet Cong begins to wage a guerrilla war against the South Vietnamese government in the hopes of overthrowing them and reuniting the country with the North, okay? So the Viet Cong relies upon guerrilla warfare, okay? This involves constantly ambushing the South Vietnamese government's forces, their officials, attacking government buildings and then retreating as fast as they can, okay? They dedicate significant resources to gaining the support of the peasants, okay? Either willingly, by, you know, being nice to them and helping with their harvests, or by intimidating any reluctant peasants against opposing them, okay? So the peasantry of South Vietnam overwhelmingly support the Viet Cong, either because they do support them, because they're nice to them, and guess what? The, Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese government is not nice to them, or for those of them who are not supportive of the Viet Cong, they will keep their mouth shut because if they don't, they'll be killed, okay? In sometimes very brutal fashion. So the, the Viet Cong have significant control over the Vietnamese countryside, okay? Which is again a very important theme to understand about the, the, the Vietnam War. As I said, the, Vietnam, the Viet Cong does not get involved, generally speaking, in large pitched battles. Pitched battles meaning one side fighting the other kind of in like a big field, for example. They rely upon secrecy when it comes to getting around and quickly disappearing after an attack so they are hard to target and capture. So you ambush somebody not expecting it and no sooner have you killed like 20 people, you disappear and nowhere to be seen again, okay? And so for the average Viet South Vietnamese government soldier or later on the Americans, this is a nightmare to deal with, okay? And it's also quite a scary prospect. You could be attacked at any moment out of nowhere, okay? In the, when you're in the jungle of the countryside. And so, additionally, they use their links to the peasants to hide out in the countryside, okay? Guerrillas famously are successful in most countries because they hide, in plain, they hide in plain sight amongst the civilians, okay? And it's difficult to decide and work out who is a civilian and who is a fighter, okay? In some ways, they're hiding behind civilians. It's a very controversial thing to do, but the peasants are okay to let them do that for the most part. And this is something we'll come back to later on. Um, last point to quickly mention, you'll hear about this thing called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, okay? So how, is the North, how are the North Vietnamese supplying these guerrillas? They have this really impressive network of roads that go through the jungles of Laos and Cambodia, which borders Vietnam to the west, okay? This is called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And they basically have tens of thousands of volunteers keeping this trail open to transport supplies down through the, and the south through, through Vietnam and moving into Vietnam at various different stages of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, you can get full mark questions asking you what's the Ho Chi Minh Trail, so you just need to know about it. It's also worth understanding that this is how the North Vietnamese government funds and supplies the Viet Cong, okay? And so the VC overall were a very formidable government. And the South, sorry, opponent, and the South Vietnamese government were hopelessly incapable of dealing with them. So just a quick point to mention right off the bat, if the, if the South Vietnamese government were left to their own devices to deal with the Viet Cong, they would have failed miserably very, very quickly. And that is what was happening. Over the course of the 50s, the, the Viet Cong were an increasingly difficult prospect to deal with and were massively undermining the South Vietnamese government, okay? And so what we see happening over the course of the Vietnam War is the Americans being increasingly dragged into the Vietnam War to back an increasingly hopeless and increasingly reliant um, South Vietnamese government that looks like it will fail if the Americans pull out and lead them to their own devices. So um, 
The government itself was propped up only due to the increasingly heavy backing of the US government, okay, which, as we've seen beforehand, believes in the domino theory. Okay? And they decide that, like Korea, if they allow the South to fall to communism, this would be a crucial part of the domino theory in action. And so the US wants to put them up. However, the US was actually quite cautious about getting too involved in the Korean, in the, in the, in the, in the, um, the, the Vietnam War. Instead, they were dragged deeper and deeper into it over the course of multiple presidencies before finally withdrawing 20 years after first sending soldiers into Vietnam. Um, and as I say, they knew from the beginning what they were doing was not ideal. And it's kind of one of those situations where they can stay, know they are kind of making moral mistakes, but they feel like to stop doing what they're doing will be an even bigger mistake. And they have to keep plowing ahead with their terrible strategy and decision making. And so in many ways, the, the, the Vietnam War is this terrible tragedy on the part of well, all sides, really. So I'm going to run through a brief summary of how each president gradually escalates American involvement in the war. And in, in doing so, I'll give a brief summary of the Viet, Vietnam War in terms of the key events. And I'll then kind of go back and look at why the Americans lost the war. Okay? So the first US president to get involved in, Korea, in, the, in the Vietnam War is Eisenhower. Okay? Eisenhower involves the US in Vietnam as early as the war with France, okay? So he had, he had planes, American planes, supporting French troops during some operations when the French were fighting the Viet Minh in their, in their war of independence, basically. When the new government was set up in the South, he offers economic aid to the South Vietnamese government and also some military support in terms of giving them weapons and funding. He also sends the first US combat troops into Vietnam. Now, these are called advisors. Okay. However, they're soldiers, basically. Advisors aren't guys, you know, giving advice to soldiers. They're basically leading South Vietnamese soldiers in operations in many, in many cases. So 900 military advisors were sent to the South to help deal with the uprisings that had begun, okay, in the mid-1950s. So Eisenhower kind of dips the Americans' toes into Vietnam, so to speak. Kennedy, when he comes into power, continues where Eisenhower had left off. Okay, so Kennedy again was somebody who was very skeptical about the Vietnam War, but again felt like they didn't have the option of doing nothing, so we've got to do something, um, which is again a terrible, terrible philosophy, but it is what it is. So um, Kennedy increases the funding of the southern government and also massively increases the number of military advisors in, in um, Vietnam. 12,000 US troops were now stationed in Vietnam by the end of 1962, okay? And the Americans had also supplied the Vietnamese government with 300 attack helicopters. However, this is not doing much for Ziem. He's still a terrible leader and the people hate him. So by 1963, Ziem was as unpopular as ever and huge protests continued to take place in the cities across South Vietnam. Most famously, there were these big protests involving Buddhist monks where a Buddhist monk burns himself alive and commits suicide, basically in protest. And the reaction of the government is basically, um, yeah, great, let them burn themselves alive because they're very anti-Buddhist. Um, and when many other Buddhists kind of follow suit or you know, protest to the government, the government responds by cracking down and arresting thousands of, of priests or monks. And again, so the, the government response to protests is more and more repression. But the protests are not quelled. People are, are very angry with ZM. He's a terrible leader. He's corrupt. People are poor. They're angry. And, you know, he disrespects Vietnamese heritage. The list goes on and on. So in November, ZM is overthrown by a military coup of people who basically have the same policies as him, but they think, well, he's unpopular. We'll take over instead. This throws Vietnam into massive chaos, okay? Over the next five, six years, I think Vietnam has something like a dozen different military coups where people are overthrown and put in place and someone else put in place. So the already weak southern government was now in total chaos, okay? And genuinely, there's nothing keeping them up at this point aside from American support, okay? Um, and the corruption goes from bad to worse. The repression remains. Like, the, the problem of the incompetent government is never solved. It just remains incompetent and terrible. And again, the Americans know the, that the government is rubbish, but they feel like they can't do anything about it. And they just have to keep propping it up, even though they dislike the leaders and think they're terrible. Um, but again, 
they have this hopeless sense of what else can we do. However, the, the Vietnam War really massively escalates in 1963. And by this point, America has been involved in, in Vietnam for eight years, okay? But it is, in, it is 1963 when things start to escalate. Kennedy is assassinated, and as is the case in America, his replacement is the vice president, a man called Lyndon B. Johnson. Lyndon B. Johnson was an even greater supporter of the war in Vietnam, and he believed a full-scale war would be necessary in Vietnam to help the spread of communism. So in his mind, he thinks America has to stop pussyfooting around and just go in and get rid of the, get rid of the communists with full force, okay? And the South was still in massive chaos following the coup against Diem. A year later, Johnson has given the excuse he needs for his plan, for his, basically to, to carry out his plan. And something called the Gulf, the Gulf of Tonkin incident takes place, okay? Where two American warships are attacked by North Vietnamese gunboats while they were in international waters, but off the coast of North Vietnam. Johnson is like, amazing, this is my chance to, do, to have my full-scale war. He convinces the Congress to grant, to put to pass a resolution that grants Johnson powers to massively escalate the war in Vietnam, which is what he does. So the war in Vietnam in terms of the American involvement really gets underway under Johnson. And the Vietnam War is often seen as Johnson's war, even though it started under Eisenhower and then Kennedy. And so Johnson escalates the Vietnam War in two main ways. The first thing is he significantly increases the US ground troop presence in Vietnam to fight the Viet Cong or the VC. And this time they are officially called combat troops and not advisors, so it's actual soldiers, okay, officially. The government actually institutes a draft system, okay, whereby young men are chosen at random for like a lottery system and are called up to fight for the army as and when needed. Having said that, there are exemptions, but those exemptions are often things like college education. So these people disproportionately come from the lower classes in America, and as we'll mention later on, that has a very significant impact on how the war is waged from the American perspective. So by 1968, over 500,000 American soldiers are stationed in Vietnam, half a million US troops, a significant number. So this is a major war. The second thing is he begins a huge bombing campaign known as Operation Rolling Thunder. And again, you can get four mark questions asking you, what is Operation Rolling Thunder? And so basically, the US for the next eight years has a huge, an absolutely enormous bombing campaign against the North Vietnamese to put pressure on them to come to the negotiating table. So Johnson decides it is North Vietnam that is backing the Viet Cong and it is the North Vietnamese who will get the VC to negotiate. So even though it's the VC fighting, to be honest, the North Vietnamese are involved in the war. So Johnson decides to bomb the hell out of North Vietnam to put pressure on them to halt the war and stop backing the VC. And so you have a massive bombing campaign of northern cities, factory ba factories, bases, and also crucially, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, okay? Again, to try and put pressure and make it difficult for the supply lines and disrupt the supply lines of the Viet Cong. This escalation by Johnson leads to the war becoming extremely bloody, okay? And the body count significantly increases on both sides of the conflict. And it has a, it has a devastating impact on, on North Vietnam. And Operation Rolling Thunder does. Um, so, here's the thing. Johnson had a really simplistic view of success and how to measure success in Vietnam. The Americans begin to measure success, essentially, like this as, as crazy as it sounds, by their kill count, okay? They start counting deaths of enemy soldiers. And in their view, if they're killing enemy soldiers as much as possible, that is putting pressure on the North, okay? who that will put pressure on them quitting. And the Americans begin to believe by 1967 that this is working. Oil and Thunder is working, we're winning the war, we're putting huge pressure on the North Vietnamese, they're close to being exhausted. And crucially, this is what they are telling the public back home. The American government is claiming to the public back home that the Viet Cong and the, the, the North Vietnamese government is close to quitting because their pressure is working, okay? And the, the, war's, the war's close to an end because they're, they're exhausted. This was a fantasy, okay? It was nonsense. And this, was, this fantasy was dispelled in brutal fashion in 
in January 1968, when the North Vietnamese, just as the people in America are being told that the Vietnam War is close to ending, the Viet Cong are exhausted, it's, it's almost over, the North launches their greatest attack of the war called the Tet Offensive. They attack 30 different targets and cities in, across the South, including um, the major cities, Da Nang and um, the, the capital, um, Saigon. This includes capturing the US Embassy in Saigon, okay? The Viet Cong are so strong still, they are able to launch attacks deep into US-controlled territory, including the capital of South Vietnam, and capture the US Embassy, okay? At this point, this idea that the, that the Viet Cong are being weakened is exposed as being an absolute nonsense, okay? The Tet Offensive is a strategic failure for the North Vietnamese, and actually for the North Vietnamese, it's also a disaster because there was a lot of soldiers in the process. It was, it was a dumb, dumb um, maneuver on their part. That wasn't really how they fought traditionally. But it still hurt the Americans more because the psychological impact back home, and I'll mention this more later, showed that the war was nowhere near done and the public no longer believed what the government was telling them, okay? And so support for the Vietnam War falls massively after the Tet Offensive. In addition, that same year, there is increasing anger over controversial abuse of citizens by US soldiers. Um, for example, the My, the My Lai Massacre, which I'll talk about later on, okay? And so 1968, Johnson, because of his massive unpopularity as a result of the Vietnam War, decides not to run again for president. He stands down. That year, he is then replaced by a terrible, terrible human being called Richard Nixon. I'm not going to he's an awful person, but he's an awful person. Um, so Richard Nixon comes to power and the US public are desperate to see the back of the Vietnam War, okay? And the new US President Nixon who comes in is seeking as well to withdraw from the US, to withdraw the US from the war because he knows it's a, it's a disaster. However, they cannot simply hand over South Vietnam and admit defeat, okay? So Nixon is trying to search for a peace with honor, okay? He wants to make a peace deal in Vietnam, but not, you know, sell out the South Vietnamese if possible and admit defeat. So his policy involves a couple of things, mainly something called Vietnamization, which basically means handing over responsibility for fighting the war to Southern troops. And in his first two years of the war, he withdraws over 400,000 troops um, from Vietnam. But at the same time, he tries to increase the pressure on the, on the North Vietnamese by massively increasing the bombing campaign and also he extends the bombing campaign to nearby Cambodia and Laos, in particular bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail a lot more viciously. And the idea is, this is to put pressure on the North to agree a peace deal. Um, in the end, he is able to agree a peace deal with the North, leading to Nixon withdrawing all US troops in 1973. However, the war between the VC and the South reignites within months of the final withdrawal of the, of the US soldiers, okay? And this time, without the support of the US, the South is totally unable to repel the communist forces who managed to totally defeat the South Vietnamese government by 1975. And so the communists therefore win the, 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 the Vietnam War overall, and they would, they would then go on to unify Vietnam under their rule, under whom it remains today. So as I'll mention later on, as an overall summary, it's a massive failure for containment and it's a terrible, terrible incident for the Americans. But what I want to go over just to wrap up very quickly is why does the US lose the Vietnam War, okay? The, the, when you look at the Vietnam War, the US is a vastly superior military force than the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese government, okay? And they put in huge effort and resources into the war, yet they ultimately lose this war okay, in quite terrible fashion. And this is mainly down to four main reasons we could say, okay. The terrible US tactics versus the very good um, Viet Cong tactics, the press coverage of the war, the anti-war protest movement, and there's also the individual role of specific events, okay. And I'm going to talk about two specific events, the Tet Offensive, again, I'll bring up, and also the My Lai Massacre. So poor US tactics. In a nutshell, the US had horrible tactics for the, for, the, for the Vietnam War, okay? The first thing is they relied mainly on bombing between 1965 to 1972. However, 
Despite the enormous damage done by the homing campaign, this was not enough to defeat the communists, okay? It only slowed them down. They thought this could force the communists to want to give up the war and negotiate more seriously. It didn't, okay? The communists were determined, maybe more, maybe more, more determined to keep to carry on fighting as fiercely as possible. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, because of this, the, the Viet Cong's guerrilla tactics where they hid amongst the civilians, the US found it extremely difficult to know who was a VC fighter. As a result, the US often went on what they called search and destroy missions in the villages to hunt down any Viet Cong fighters involved, okay? Or to hunt down, to hunt down any Viet Cong fighters. This often involved killing far more innocent civilians who were mistaken for the Viet Cong or killed as collateral. There are some estimates that on search and destroy raids, you could sometimes have, for every one VC killed, six innocent civilians killed. Thirdly, they used chemical weapons to strip the leaves from the jungle to make it easier to monitor places. So they used to drop chemical weapons, Agent Orange and Napalm is the most famous, the most famous examples, uh, to destroy jungles where the VC hid, okay? This, again, also often saw many civilians killed or injured in brutal ways as a result. So these first three points, the bombing, which killed the civilians, the search and destroy missions, and the chemical weapons, this turns the ordinary Vietnamese people against the Vietnamese government and the Americans and in favor of the VC. You're making it easier for the VC to recruit people and maintain support of the peasants, okay? It was a terrible decision to make. Lastly, the American soldiers were extremely low quality. It's in particular once the draft began, okay? As I've already mentioned, these are often young, uneducated men, because the draft, you can escape it if you're educated or got a college degree, from poor backgrounds, who know nothing about Vietnam. They don't give a damn about spreading democracy and preventing communism from spreading. These are guys that have no motivation to fight at all, and often, basically, when they get to Vietnam, become depressed and addicted to drugs. Drug addiction is massively prevalent in the Vietnam War amongst the these young US soldiers. So you have really low quality US soldiers in the latter half of the war, okay? And so on the whole, the US had terrible tactics when it came to fighting the Vietnam War. In contrast, the Viet Cong had excellent tactics, okay? The VC were heavily outnumbered and less well, less well equipped and therefore always avoided open, and, and therefore always avoided open warfare. Okay, so they basically fought a war which suited their own strengths, okay? They fought guerrilla warfare and only ever engaged in combat on their own terms, okay? They had no headquarters that could be destroyed, for example, okay, very easily. They laid booby traps all over the countryside so that people could you know, often like, fall into traps or spike like death traps at any moment in time, okay? And they relied upon ambushes to attack southern slash US soldiers and escape immediately afterwards as soon as they had attacked them, okay? So they chose the perfect tactics to suit their essentially strength and weaknesses. In contrast as well to the US search and destroy missions, the US, the VC rather, dealt far better with the peasants and tried to be as helpful as possible to keep them on side, okay? And in some cases, to sort of from betraying them to the US army, they'd often kill them if necessary. But on the whole, they treat the, they treat the peasants well, in contrast to the Americans, who will often murder peasants by mistake because, oh well, he might be a VC. So this, the VC taxes were far, far better. And lastly, compared to the low morale soldiers the US had fighting for them, the Viet Cong were often really deeply committed to the cause, and they had unshakable morale, okay? And the severity of the war only hardened that result because guess what? These guys weren't fighting for communism, they were fighting for national liberation. And this is something the Americans did not understand. They could not understand these were not guys simply fighting due to their love of communism. It was purely for national liberation, okay? And so they had unshakable morale and determination to fight the war. So they had far better tactics than the Americans with terrible tactics. The second issue is the press coverage. This is a really crucial part of why the Americans were the war, which you can't underestimate. So initially, like all wars, the coverage of the war by the press in America is positive. However, as time goes on and it becomes clear that the war was a disaster, 
the US media gradually turns upon the American government and the war effort, okay? And so the media attacks the, the government on two fronts. Number one, on a practical level, okay? They argue the US was in fact losing the war, okay? And they spend a lot of time debunking claims otherwise, okay? And they also, the second part of it, is they regularly reported on the atrocities being committed by the American soldiers in the war, okay? This is, on, the, on that second point, this is the first time the public was ever getting a close to uncensored account of what was happening in a war for the first time. So they are seeing in front of their eyes while they're eating dinner every single night, footage of peasants having their huts set on fire by, by US army soldiers. Prisoners being executed brutally by South Vietnamese army officers. Um, children crying because their, their skin's being burnt off by napalm burns. burns. These are disturbing images that really sicken the average American and makes them realize that will question, is this really a just war? Are we actually the good guys in this conflict? And so support for the war massively drops due to press coverage, both because they realize the war is going badly, and also because of conduct of American soldiers in the war, okay? The public could not support what they were seeing on their TV screens night in, night out. Linked to the media coverage was the anti-war protests. The media coverage led to the war becoming increasingly unpopular, which triggered massive protests across the country against the war, okay? And while many people continued to support the government, the anti-war movement was staunchly opposed to the war, and US society becomes highly polarized and divided as a result, okay? In particular, due to the actions of some protesters, such as burning American flags, okay? So the American society really breaks apart over the issue of Vietnam over the course in the, in the 1960s. Like, if you think about what it's like right now um, over the you know, current American politics or what it was the last couple of years, honestly, the 60s is far, far worse. People genuinely hate each other over their opinions of Vietnam, okay? And you have real divisions. Um, and the scale, of the, protests, the scale of the protests themselves are very, very big. So they have the largest ever protest in US history in 1969, um, where over 700,000 people attend a protest in Washington against the Vietnam War, okay? And so the protests and the social division caused by the protest was putting a really big strain on the US government and putting great pressure on them to end the war, which they essentially do effectively do. And you can argue actually in many ways, the American government ends the war because of the protests and the public opposition which the protests represent. Last point, and this is again linked to the previous two issues, okay? There are specific individual events you should be aware of that have these major impacts on public opinion, okay, and media coverage. The first of which I've already mentioned is the Tet Offensive, okay? So as I mentioned, the media coverage was actually positive mostly until the Tet Offensive, okay? But at that point, the, the US media realizes, hang on a second, the government is lying to us, and they stop supporting the war. There's a really famous, um, there is a really, Despite the defense's, the defense's fa fa failure, the US's tactics become exposed as ineffective. Um, there's a really famous US newsman called Walter Cronkite, who presents for PBS, he's considered the most trusted man in America, who famously gives a monologue during the Tet, during the Tet Offensive, commenting on the Vietnam War, where he says, what the hell is going on? I thought we were winning this war. And he then later in the monologue says how we basically, we shouldn't continue with the war, and we should essentially, we've tried our best, but let's just accept we're not gonna win this war and just back out, okay? Um, so the Tet Offensive has a very significant impact. The second major, major impact is by the My Lai Massacre, okay? This is a really, really unsavory event. I'm not gonna go into the details because it's quite sickening and depressing, but this is effectively among the, most, among the worst atrocities ever committed by the US Army, okay? And it was uncovered, it took place in, in March 1968, but it was uncovered a year later by the press, okay? A US Army touch and destroy mission descended upon a village called My Lai, and effectively the US Army soldiers murder all 400 civilians in the village who are mostly women and children, okay? The truth of, the, of, this, of this event is revealed by an army photographer who captures the evidence, uh, evidence, of, evidence of the events, and this event basically shocks the American public and support for the war massively decreases as a result of the, um, the Milan massacre as well. And so what you get is, the US was increasingly pulled into a war, which in retrospect, they had genuinely little chance of winning, okay? Militarily, it was, again, it was impossible for them to achieve the victory they were publicly claiming to aim for, and this became increasingly clear to the public 
And so it was really only a matter of time before the US eventually had to admit defeat in the war, which they do. It's ultimately a war they couldn't win given the circumstances. And so eventually they're kind of forced to withdraw because they have no choice, okay? And so as a result, if we kind of look back at these three incidents, so Victor, that's, that's Vietnam in a nutshell. I've kind of summarized it as quickly as I, as I, as I can. I highly recommend you go back and watch some in-depth documentaries about it. A, because it's very, very interesting, and B, because it will give you a really solid understanding of, of, the, of the conflict. Um, so if we take a step back and look at our three examples of containment, okay? Um, on the whole, we can say that Korea is a mostly successful example of containment. Cuba is less about containment per se, but I would say if you got asked about it, the, the missile crisis itself is ultimately a success for the Americans, um, but Cuba does remain communist and therefore a base for spreading communism across South America. So on the containment point, I think you would say it's probably less successful if they asked you at containment in Cuba, okay? And then lastly, Vietnam, as we've just seen, is a colossal failure, okay? It's a complete failure. Um, the South is conquered by the North and it goes totally communist, as does neighboring Cambodia a few years later. Um, and this is compounded by the drawn out and controversial nature of the war and American defeat there. And so when you have 10 mark questions comparing events and containment, those are kind of the main arguments I'd run with for each event, okay? Last thing to wrap up, um, final point. Um, when you get specific terms, so you can get questions that are about containment generally. How successful was containment um, by the Americans or whatever, okay? And mostly you're, you're comparing events. Um, sometimes, however, you can get 10 mark questions that are generally about just one of those three incidents or three case studies. And sometimes they could say to you about containment specifically, but oftentimes they ask you specific questions. And the most, the most common 10 markers are, you'll often get questions saying, who won the Korean War? For Cuba, it's who won the missile crisis. And for America, sorry, for Vietnam, we know they lost the war, so that's not really a question. The most common question is often, why did the US government withdraw, slash, why did they lose the war? Which I've gone over already as the kind of 10 mark summary, okay? So I hope that clears up and gives you a good understanding of the different case studies that are involved in the containment topic. Um, if you have any questions about anything that I've talked about or anything I haven't mentioned and want it to, want it to be clarified, uh, then feel free to ask in the comments sections below. And I'll endeavor to respond to them as quickly as I can and in as much detail as I can. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I hope I found that useful um, and good luck with your revision.